August 11th, 2021, a day that would start my longest coaster trip to date, and a trip that would nearly double my then coaster count. I would go on to visit seven different parks over the course of seven days across the state of Florida, aka theme park heaven, and also hot as Hades, to keep it PG. I mean, why did they build all these parks on top of an actual swamp that averages temps in the 90s? Okay. I digress. It's my fault for visiting in the middle of August. I know Walt Disney was a legend when it came to imagination, but how he turned this into this is a modern miracle. Overall, this trip would go on to cement my love for theme parks and roller coasters alike, and it all started right here at SeaWorld Orlando. Technically, this wasn't my first trip to the park, as it went as a wee little baby Dr. Coaster. It was then when I was splashed by Shamu and started crying. True story. Before this park even had a coaster lineup. I visited again when I was a little older, but this was my first time visiting as an enthusiast. This time, I was there for the coasters, and they didn't disappoint. I arrived to the park shortly after opening at 9am, and knew that I had until mid to late afternoon before I had to leave to meet up with family in Tampa. The goal for the day was to ride everything once to get the credits, and then Marathon Mako, which I anticipated to be my favorite in the park. If I accomplished all of this in 5-6 to six hours, I was chalking it up as a successful visit. Especially since the day also entailed 8-9 to nine hours in the car. After arriving, the first thing I noticed was how quickly I got through security. This could have been due to lighter crowds, but getting into a park quickly always sets a good tone to start the day. Next up, the park entrance, and dare I say my favorite that I've ever experienced, aside from maybe Magic Kingdom, but that's it. I'm in love with sea life and being out on the water, so this entrance just blew me away. I would have probably stopped and sat there by the lighthouse for a while if I had had the time. I knew the theming at this park was going to be better than most parks, but this is when I realized it was far better than I had previously imagined. Wasting no time, I headed to the first coaster today. Which coaster? <laughs> I wasn't even sure whichever one I saw first. Which was Manta. You see, I've got this bad habit of visiting a new park and not really researching the map ahead of time. Especially if I know crowds are going to be light. I'm getting better, but it definitely made my day more interesting to say the least. Manta. Probably one of the coolest queues that I've ever seen. The aquariums in this queue really set the mood for what you're about to experience. And did I mention the air conditioning? Mm. The piece de resistance. One of the best places in the park. My only complaint is that it was so dark, I could barely see where I was going. But once I found my way through the queue, I stepped straight up to the gate and walked onto the next train. I was worried before this trip that I may not be a flying coaster fan, but Manta cleared any doubt that I had previously had. From the first drop to the final breaks, this coaster brought it. I'm going to save any further in-depth coaster analysis for a future video where I rank the rides in the park, but there's not much to dislike about this ride. I avoided POVs before this trip, and aside from the Pressel Loop and Scenic Ending, I knew nothing and was amazed by how long this ride was, and the foreign versions were totally unexpected, which made for an exhilarating ride. Okay, remember when I said there wasn't much to dislike about this ride? Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Manta Slaps, end of story. Walking off of Manta, I then wandered towards the middle of the park, where I saw the entrances to Journey to Atlantis and Kraken. I had a sneaky feeling that I would absolutely love Journey to Atlantis. Again, I knew absolutely nothing about this ride, other than that it was a hybrid water dark ride slash coaster, and that its soundtrack was supposedly legendary. Seeing that there was once again a very short wait, I once again walked straight into the station and on to the ride. After the party in the station, I very quickly realized that the theming on this ride was top tier. The first half of this ride was so chill and could stand alone as its own ride by itself in my opinion. Then there's the drop. This was far taller than I expected and made for an excellent ending to the ride. Or so I thought. Yeah, I admit it. I actually thought the ride was over at this point. I even pulled out my phone and started taking pictures of the ride. And then I saw another chain left and zipped it right back into its pocket. I don't know why I completely forgot about the coaster section of the ride, but I definitely did. It's probably because the ride felt so complete as it already was. The coaster section 
Now that made for a great ending to the ride. Overall, this ride was just straight wacky in the best possible way. It makes you want to curl up and take a nap, dance, and hold on for dear life, all in the same ride. The only complaints here were that the trains were a tad uncomfortable, and that there were a few jerky moments, especially at the beginning of that first lift. Moving on from Journey to Atlantis, I walked right around the corner of the Kraken, or Kraken Unleashed as it's apparently called. With this ride, I literally walked straight on, no wait whatsoever. I walked into the station and was the only one behind the gates while the train was being loaded, but one of the rideouts flagged me down and opened up the gate. I looked out and got put in the front row. This was my first floorless coaster, and I was pumped to see what it was all about. From what I could tell, this is a very controversial coaster amongst enthusiasts, and I went in thinking I would fall on the more negative side due to how much I enjoy a smooth ride. To my amazement, I didn't find the ride very rough at all. Yet. But we'll get to that later. As with the other coasters in the park, I was clueless to the layout of this coaster and was amazed by how tall it actually was. The head chopper also caught me totally off guard, and the angle and speed that you approach it really messes with your senses. The ride ended, and I found myself actually wanting to ride again, but I wanted to ensure that I got all the credits in and account for potential bad weather. I ended up leaving Kraken very pleased and really started to appreciate the lineup that this park boasted. I ended up walking through the Antarctica section of the park in my journey to find Mako, so I decided to snag a ride in the Empire of the Penguin Dark Ride that I'd heard great things about. For some reason, I thought this ride had reopened, so I waited 10 to 15 minutes, only to realize that the station was completely dark. I still got to cool off and see some awesome animals, so I can't complain too much. Next up, my second most anticipated coaster of the whole trip. Mako. With a five minute wait nonetheless. I couldn't believe my eyes. I knew crowds were light, but wow, I was walking onto what many consider to be one of the best coasters in the world. Oh, and the sharks on the ceiling? They were actually working. Seeing them swim off above you as you get sent to the lift hill greatly adds to the experience. I also didn't realize music would usher you up the lift hill and build upon the anticipation you were already feeling. I managed to get a seat in the back row, which was surprisingly empty. There wasn't many enthusiasts around, apparently. Once you reach the top of the lift hill, you watch the rest of the train start to head down. And then it hits you. Some of the most lethal flow of the airtime I had ever experienced. Until that five second airtime hill. I couldn't help but count from the second I came out of my seat until the second I came back down. And sure enough, I floated for five entire blissful seconds. My mind was blown. It was absolutely my favorite element I experienced on a coaster up until that point. But the airtime wasn't over. It just kept coming until I hit the final brakes and rolled back into the station. At that point, it was clear what needed to be done. I had the ride make as many times as I could. They were only running one train, but by the time I had walked back through the queue, it was time to load it again. During this marathon, I also grabbed a front row ride. While it provided an incredible experience with the wind in your face, the airtime is better in the back. I originally planned on marathoning this baby for hours, but a series of unfortunate events would derail these plans quite quickly. For those who don't know, I have a tendency to get motion sick. It hasn't always been the case, but it started a couple years ago and has persisted ever since. I had never experienced it on a coaster until a few weeks before this trip, but it was on a hot day after riding Goliath at Six Flags Over Georgia, and I hoped that it was a one-off. But that's okay. I came prepared with Jeremy and me in this trip, which I neglected to take beforehand or carry into the park with me. You stupid. All in all, I got five back-to-back -back rides, but it was clearly time to take a break before... <laughs> yeah, that. I took 20 to 30 minutes to compose myself and began to wander to find Grover's boxcar derby to reach park completion. This is where I found one of the most unexpected things of the entire day. Sesame Street. This land was far better themed than I expected. I felt like I was straight up taking a stroll down Sesame Street on my way to see Elmo and Big Bird. It was super nostalgic and an awesome added bonus for the day. Nothing too much to say about Grover's Boxcar Derby except, can we just appreciate how long those trains are? Wow. All in all, this ride could be summed up with a quote from another classic childhood cartoon. Big, scary, Enough said. Anything. Moving on. Following Grover, the nausea still hadn't completely subsided, so I decided to get some pictures and sit and appreciate Icebreaker, slash more in the fact that it wasn't open yet. I was still feeling a little uneasy, so I took another half an hour or so looking at animals and watching the sea lion and otter show, which was super enjoyable. I loved how the emphasis was placed on education and using animals as ambassadors for their species rather than just straight entertainment, like the park's previous reputation. 
After concluding the show, I was finally feeling better. Time for re-rides. I had about three to four hours left in the park. I just needed to be careful pacing myself. I started off by heading straight to Journey to Atlantis, and my first impression of this ride was 100% accurate. It was so much fun. The ride gets you just wet enough to cool you down, but not enough to where you have to slosh around in wet shoes the rest of the day. Just like early in the day, I walked straight over the Kraken, but the inevitable happened. Florida weather. I was about five feet from the entrance of the ride, and they closed the queue. I'm sure the next park is park policy, blah blah blah, but they wouldn't even let me wait the storm out from within the queue, which was very irritating. I tried to kill some time by looking at a few aquariums in the area, and then spent the next hour plus sitting on the ground in the Kraken locker area. The rain eventually cleared, but the lightning delay hadn't laughed quite yet. So I killed the remaining time trying to get some pictures. With terrible lighting. Finally, the rides in the park started testing, and I got back in the line that was starting to form outside of Kraken. This is where I started to get pretty ticked off with the way things were being run. <laughs> While standing in the line for Kraken, the other rides started sending trains. This isn't where I totally lost my patience. I was a little antsy to get back on a ride, but I understood that it could take longer for one ride over another. However, 10-15 to 15 plus minutes later, someone asked the ride out man in the entrance why it hadn't opened yet. The answer? Maintenance issues. And it hadn't been communicated to the significant line that had now formed outside the ride. So, I left. It was time for Mako again. I made it within 20-25 to 25 feet of the station, and it happened. Again. Another weather delay. The rides must have been open for a whopping 20 minutes at that point. Fast forward another 20-25 minutes, and I was back in line for Mako, where I got another incredible ride and decided to get back in line. Until I saw it. Everyone had flocked to the coasters after the weather delays, and Mako was running one train. I had about an hour left in the park, and this was going to eat up most of it. I needed another ride on Manta and Kraken, so I circled back and miraculously, Kraken was back open. Finally, a lucky break. I snagged a back row ride this time, and sheesh, anything I said about this not being that rough was totally forgotten. This thing is like some demented mullet from the coaster world. It's a party in the front, and a straight up concussion in the back. I really wanted another ride up front, but time was at a premium, so off to Manta I went. I snagged a front row ride this time, and this confirmed how great this ride was. The stacking was even worse this time, but I still managed to get on and off the ride far quicker than expected, given the weights of the other rides. I checked the time when I got off the ride, and had a little over half an hour until I had to be back on the road. I then checked Mako's weight, and the post-weather surge had subsided. It was time for one last ride. So I took off across the park, walking like a madman. I made it with a little under 20 minutes left, calves burning and heart thumping. And there it was. No, not Mako. The ride closed sign. <sighs> I guess this was a fitting way to end the day. I looked up from the ride closed sign to see the ride stuck on the brake run. At least it wasn't weather, I guess. Defeated, I headed back to the front of the park. There was one last thing I wanted to do before leaving, and that was to snag that iconic Manta picture. So I got to the spot. Ten minutes to spare. I get the camera open and ready. A couple of trains had just gone by, and I was ready for the next one. Until... I take back what I said about Mako. This was a fitting way to end the day. Now I could leave the park with this trainless photo, knowing that it so perfectly wrapped up such a crazy day. But the story doesn't end here, folks. Oh no. There's more. By a stroke of good fortune, I stumbled upon SeaWorld's Sunny Day Guarantee, and was granted another day ticket to be used within the next year so I'll be able to return to settle the unfinished business I've got with Icebreaker. Until then, this crazy chapter has come to a close, with a sequel waiting on the horizon. Thank you all for watching. What's your favorite ride at SeaWorld Orlando? Let me know in the comments below. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing and liking this video. I can't believe I just hit 50 subscribers. I'm extremely grateful. I seriously couldn't have done it without you. I've been growing way faster than I could have ever expected, and I really appreciate the support. With that said, I'm also on Instagram at Dr. Underscore Coaster, where I post more content just like this. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.